Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, this is Kivanj. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about my first pull request. And this is really uh, going to be a talk about, um, you know, introduction to uh, the world of open source, uh, introduction to Git and, uh, and pull requests and whatnot. Um, so if you consider yourself a beginner, uh, I hope you will find uh, a lot of useful stuff uh, in this presentation. Um, and if you consider yourself an experienced uh, seasoned uh, developer, uh, I still hope you will find um, some stuff that uh, you find useful. Uh, slides are already available at this URL. Um, let's get started. So I want to uh, start with actually uh, showing my first pull request. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, I was still a student in college. Uh, I had no professional experience whatsoever. So um, I had no self-confidence in contributing to uh, an already established open source project. Um, but I still wanted to do something. Um, and one day I realized one of the applications I was using um, was an open source project that's available uh, on github.com uh, and it was accepting uh, merge requests, uh, pull requests. Um, and I, I realized that the application uh, was translated, uh, it, it was already translated to multiple languages, uh, but Turkish, my first language, uh, was not there yet. So I figured, okay, this is, this is a good chance for me. Uh, I should give this a try. Uh, and what I did was I translated the app into Turkish. It was only a number of strings anyway, uh, but it was a great experience for me. Um, and I submitted a pull request and the pull request got merged and I uh, got a re re um, message from the maintainer saying, thank you. So that was uh, an, a great experience for me. I felt like a, like a happiness. Um, I felt super happy uh, because the, the patch that I had written uh, is now shipped to people who are using this app. Um, I don't really know how many people ended up using uh, this particular application in Turkish, honestly, uh, but I, it still felt great. And I, um, I kept doing it. I kept submitting pull requests to um, other applications as well. So the whole point of this presentation is kind of give you the motivation, uh, the encouragement, uh, and give you the basics of the tools uh, for you to do it as well. So I want you to give this a try as well uh, and see if you like it. And if you like it, you can keep doing it. Um, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will talk a little about basics of um, open source and licenses. Uh, I'll talk a little about source control, uh, pull requests, uh, and then I'll do a demo. Uh, and then I'll close with um, some notes as well. Um, Unfortunately, I think this presentation will take um, uh, pretty much the entire allocated time. Um, so if you have any questions, I will leave my uh, email address in the chat uh, of the Zoom. Uh, feel free to connect with me there, or you can also submit, you can also uh, chat with me in the uh, conference lobby as well. Uh, before I go into the uh, definition of open source and uh, and, and the details about licenses, I want to tell you that I'm not a lawyer uh, and this is not a legal advice. So if you um, are looking for professional help with regards to licenses, you should probably get it from a professional. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, let me start with terminology. Um, what, um, so these are some of the things that I found are worth highlighting uh, for this introductory talk. Uh, and these are some of the things that I had uh, a little hard time understanding, differentiating. Uh, I had some misconceptions about. Um, so for example, open source, what does an open source mean? What does it mean for a project to be an open source project? Can you call a project an open source project if you put the code online? Uh, well, that's not entirely true. Uh, if, you, if you publish your project's code online that only makes it source available, uh, doesn't make it necessarily open source. Um, if you attended uh, keynote, you might have um, uh, seen Josh's talk about the technical requirement for uh, uh, an open source project. Um, it technically, the the open source term is it usually is associated with open source initiative and free software foundation is usually associated with uh, free software. 
and they have each uh, a set of rules. So open source initiative has its uh, list of rules and free software foundation has its list of uh, freedoms. Um, and they go through uh, publicly available licenses and they approve uh, some of those licenses saying, okay, this license uh, fits our rules. So uh, in order to be, uh, in order for your project to be an open source project, uh, you need to publish your code and your project need to have that, uh, need to have a license that is approved by uh, open source initiative, for example, for you to be able to call it an open source project. And uh, I was also confused between uh, difference of open source and free software. And uh, while they are very similar things, I think a minor difference is uh, free software uh, tries to make sure a software stays free forever. And free here doesn't mean free uh, as in it doesn't cost any money. Uh, it means free as in freedom, it, free as in liberty, um, while open source is a little more permissive with that aspect. Uh, but you may see those two terms used interchangeably. You can also see those terms shortened uh, like FOSS uh, stands for free open source software um, and FLOSS stands for free libre open source software. So you, you can see all those terms around. Um, and with regards to licenses, so there are some files that um, usually go into these projects uh, and license, uh, license is one of those files. Um, so license um, is attached to the project, it tells, other people what they can do with the project. Uh, if there is no license in the project, they have no idea whether they can copy the code, whether they can contribute the code, whether they can modify it and distribute the modified code, they have no idea. Uh, but if you have a license, that's clear. Um, and uh, it, it seems that there's two main groups of licenses that are uh, permissive and copyleft. And um, like I already mentioned, uh, permissive, uh, the, the difference is the couple left is trying to make sure that it stays free forever, uh, while permissive is well, a little more permissive. But again, this is uh, this is an oversimplification of how it is. Uh, this is uh, a, an oversimplification of generalization. Um, so this is just enough to get you started. Um, you should probably read more about licenses if you're interested. Um, and just to give an example, uh, the MIT license is a common permissive license that's been used and GPL version three um, is, a, is a couple left license. Okay. Um, with that said, um, I want to move to source control and specifically, I want to talk about Git. Um, Git is a piece of software that helps you track the progress of your software development. So. The way it works is you, for example, write some code and you create a checkpoint and then you add, write some more code and then you create another checkpoint. So by doing that, you create a, uh, a source tree. You create a tree uh, where you can refer back to the previous versions of your source code. Um, this, is, uh, this is really useful um, just to give one example. Um, for example, you noticed a bug uh, in your code, you found the line that uh, is causing the bug, uh, and you want to find out why this line is added. So you can go to your Git history and find out uh, what, uh, what is, who added that line and why did they add that line. Uh, and they, you can uh, understand uh, the reasoning at the time and uh, you can look at the uh, you know, details of what was happening at the time. Um, there are other softwares that achieve the same goal like SVN and CVS, but today I'm only going to talk about Git. And when introducing Git, I want to introduce only some keywords or only uh, some key concepts. And uh, the first one is repository. Uh, this is also referred to as a, a shortened repo. Uh, a repository is, it's, it's, like, it's just like a storage. For your, uh, for your project. Um, think of it, for example, if it's on your local computer, think of it as a directory. It's a folder that has all your project files in it. Um, 
a repository where you create your comments, a repository um, uh, where you have your branches. So the next, the next is uh, the commit. Commits are actually checkpoints. Um, when you have your Git repository, uh, when you make some changes, uh, like I already uh, described a minute ago, you create checkpoints, and these checkpoints are called commits. You you create a commit, uh, and then you just move that commit around um, to, for example, share your code with other people. Um, there is also branches. Since we are talking about trees, um, branches uh, is also um, easy to um, visualize if you think about trees. Um, you, we talked about you know adding comments, adding checkpoints. But where do you add those comments? There is a default branch uh, of the tree um, that by default you're adding your comments to. And this default branch can be named, it can be named main, it can be named master, can be named default, stable, latest, uh, trunk, depending on the repository. Um, so as you keep adding commits to your main branch, uh, that's where you grow your repository. Um, there's, there's also, well, you know, you, you don't have to use default branch for everything. You're free to use feature branches. You're free to use multiple branches uh, for other things you want to do. Um, for example, if you're on a, a 10 people uh, development team, you can have uh, all of your developers work on their own feature branches and then maybe have them merge their branches back to default branch. Um, another nice thing about feature branches could be that you know if you want to uh, submit multiple patches, multiple pull requests to a repository. Um, you can uh, create multiple feature branches uh, and then submit pull requests for each of those feature branches. So feature branches are really useful and it's, it's used a lot, uh, but I'm not going to go into any more details about feature branches. Uh, I won't be uh, showing, showing it in my examples. I won't be showing it in demo. Uh, but you should still know about it. Uh, the, the last item I have here is optional remote. Um, and let's, let's, let's think about it. I was describing repository as a directory, as a folder in your, in your uh, personal computer, right? Um, well, you can start a good repository on your laptop, for example, uh, and then just keep working on, keep work on there, keep working on there. Uh, you don't have to push it anywhere. You don't have to have it talk to outside world, but optionally, you can designate a remote. You can host that remote by yourself, or you can use a Git service like GitHub or GitLab or you know, any other service that's available. Um, once you have a remote, uh, that makes things much easier, for example, for uh, uh, teams with multiple people. Um, if we go back to that example of a team of 10 developers. If you have a, a github.com remote, for example, uh, and if you have 10 people working on their own, uh, their own laptops, uh, they can push their changes, they can push their work back to this uh, central GitHub uh, remote. And they can pull changes of other people from that remote as well. So this kind of becomes like uh, the source of truth for a, for a multiple for a team with multiple developers, um, it also helps. Like if you're using a, a common Git service like GitHub or GitLab, it also helps um, other people to discover your repository, discover your project, uh, and they can uh, once they discover about uh, once they once they see your project, they they are uh, able to contribute to it. And however, if you have your project only on your uh, local machine, that's, um, that's a little hard. Okay, um, here I'm going to show you what I described um, uh, in an example. Um, we talked about, you know, branches, we talked about uh, comments, uh, and I will, uh, I will show you, I'll show those to you with an example. And I'll also introduce some Git comments uh, while working through the example. So here I'm showing this A uh, uh, circle. This 
uh, I'm using a circle to refer to a comment. So think about this circle as a comment. And this comment is named A. So it's a comment A. Um, and also assume that this is happening on remote. So for example, this is uh, a repository that lives on github.com. Um, it has only one comment in it. Uh, and this is its main branch, the default branch. The main branch is pointing towards this comment A. Another thing I should have mentioned is uh, these branches are really pointers to comments. So when you, when you say my main branch is uh, at commit A, what, what I actually mean is my main branch is pointing to commit A. Uh, so that's, that's the remote repository with one branch, uh, one commit. If I want to, I want to have a copy of this repository in my local machine. Uh, so this lives on github.com and I want to have a copy of this in my laptop as well. Uh, what I do is I run git clone um, and it brings the exact same repository to my local machine. So now I have two copies that are the same. Just for sake of example, assume someone else pushed uh, a commit to this remote. Um, so it's main branch is now ahead one comment compared to my local main branch. Uh, and you see, you will see that the, uh, the order of the comments, uh, the first initial comment is still there uh, and there's an additional comment B that is added afterwards. So I want to make these even, I want to have the change that is in remote to uh, appear in my local machine. And what I do is I run git pull. Uh, that means pull changes from remote and that makes them even. And if it was the other way around, uh, meaning I had an extra commit in my local brand, uh, local uh, copy, uh, I would be able to make remote and local even with git push. So if I run git push, it pushes this C commit C back to remote. So that's just one example. Uh, this is another way to show how things work. Um, assume again, this is remote and this is my local machine. Uh, you can also assume this is github.com and this is, uh, this is my laptop. Uh, we looked at pool, which uh, brings changes in remote back to my, my own computer. Uh, and we talked about push, which pushes the changes in my local back to GitHub. But uh, think about this you make a change to a file and then you run git push. Um, git will give you an error message because git has no idea what you are trying to push. You can't just make changes and expect git to uh, figure out of those changes, which ones you want to push. Uh, git can't push differences. Uh, git can't push those changes. For git to be able to push, you need to create comments. You need to create checkpoints. Uh, so if you have that commit C, for example, you can push that commit C. Um, so you need to go through this commit command before you do a push command. Um, and again, assume you have made some changes uh, in your files and then you run git commit to create a commit. It will give you an error again because it can't figure out which of those changes you want to be included in the upcoming commit. Uh, so there's an extra area called stage. And what git commit does, takes the stage and um, makes it into a checkpoint. So once you have your changes in your working directory, you need to run another command that's, that's, uh, that's called add. So you need to run git add and specify the changes you want to be included in the upcoming comment. Once you do that, uh, you have your changes in stage, you can run git commit. And once you have run git commit, uh, you have your new checkpoint that you can push back to remote. Some other useful git commands uh, that I often use, um, and then I will, uh, and I will use in the demonstration um, is git status and git log. Uh, once you run git status, it'll tell you um, whether your local is ahead or even with remote. 
uh, it will tell you about the uh, changes in working directory. It will tell you about the changes in uh, stage. Um, and if you have a, if you have a comment, it will tell you that too. And Git log will just list you. Um, Git log will list you the uh, uh, the comments in your branch. Uh, let's talk a little about uh, pull requests. Uh, and I know the talks about pull requests mainly, uh, but I want to tell you that pull requests are not the only way to contribute to an open source project. Um, you can go ahead and submit you know, bug reports or verify bug reports uh, among many other things that you can do, uh, but just wanted to uh, get this out of the way. Pull requests are not the only way. Uh, and pull request is actually a patch uh, that is submitted to a repository. Um, we talked about making, uh, creating a commit, creating a checkpoint, we just take your checkpoint and go back to uh, the maintainer of the repository that you want to contribute to and tell them, hey, uh, I made this patch, would you be interested in it? Um, these are also called pull requ uh, merge requests and change requests in different platforms. Um, you can send a pull request on GitHub, GitLab um, uh, and emails too. So some projects actually prefer uh, sharing patches with emails instead of you know, uh, using platforms like GitHub. And some projects you will find out, uh, even though they have a mirror on GitHub or GitLab, uh, they still prefer you to submit a patch via email. So um, I talked a little about the a little a tiny files in uh, project uh, directory, license was one of them. Uh, readme file is another one. Uh, so you should probably check readme file before contributing to a project. They might have a clue on how they accept um, patches. Uh, you can. You should also check if there's a contributing.md file. Um, that contributing file usually describes how they accept patches. So pull requests usually come with a, uh, a description. So um, as a contributor, for example, if you're submitting a pull request, you often go and say, uh, this is my reasoning in building this uh, pull request. Um, if you are interested, please merge it, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it, sometimes maintainers reply to you saying like, saying things like, um, uh, you know, they ask you to clarify some stuff, they ask you to change some stuff, et cetera. So that's a nice thing that is attached to a pull request. Um, pull requests can include code changes. It can include adding a new test, you know, removing a test that doesn't, uh, that is not needed, needed or uh, fixing a broken test, you know, adding some design, adding some documentation, updating some documentation, documenting a feature that was not documented before, adding a translation. So anything goes really. Um, okay, here is an example of a pull request being submitted. Um, this is my code here. It prints first names of people. It just prints first name. That's that's all it does. Um, the, this project is called maintainer slash name print. So the name of the project is actually name print uh, and it's under maintainer's namespace. So this person called maintainer is maintaining this name print project. So if someone else named contributor comes across this repository, they can't directly push to it because it's someone else's repository. It's not their own repository. Um, and here what's happening is called uh, as, a, as a fork. Uh, they are forking uh, maintainer slash name print into their own account. So they're, they have the same copy, they have the same repository under their namespace now. And once they do that, once they have a copy, they can make any change uh, they want. So for example, instead of printing first names, uh, they can go with printing full names. And once they've made their changes, they can go back to maintainer and say, hey, uh, would you be interested in these changes that I made? And that's the pull request. Uh, if it's merged, the original project, maintainer slash name print, now prints full names as well. Um, let's look at the same example on a different level. Uh, this is maintainer's uh, account on github.com. Uh, and this is its initial comment. Uh, the main branch is pointing to this initial comment. 
uh, they push a second commit that says add print.py, which is the file that prints the first names. And the main branch is pointing to that. So contributor comes along, finds this repository on github.com, and they want to fork this repository into their own account. Uh, once they do that, they have a copy of the repository, a fork of the repository uh, under their own namespace. And once they have this copy on GitHub, they can clone this into their, uh, for example, laptops. Uh, if they do that, they have a third copy that lives on the, on the uh, local computer. Um, now it's easier to add a commit. So they add, uh, they make some changes. Instead of printing full, uh, first names, it prints full names instead. Uh, and the main branch, as you can see, is ahead uh, by one commit compared to its remote. They, uh, uh, they run a git push so that this change is pushed back to here. Remember, since this is under maintainer's namespace, they can't push here. They have no permission. So once this is pushed, uh, the only step that's left is the submitting the pull request. Uh, once they submit the pull request, uh, the maintainer uh, can decide whether or not to merge it. And once it's merged, you will see the maintainer's remote uh, has this uh, third commit useful name from contributor. So that's the example I had, and that's what I'm going to um, demo. So I have. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I have prepared uh, two GitHub accounts. Um, and please feel free to stop me if you can't see my, uh, my browser. Uh, the first account is uh, OS contributor that I will use for contributor. And the second account I have is called OS maintainer that I will use for maintainer. Uh, so for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll be wearing different, uh, two different hats, quite literally. Um, and I'll start with wearing my maintainer hat. Um, the first thing I will do is I will click this plus button here and then click new repository. Uh, that's the first way to, uh, that's an easy way to create a repository on GitHub. I'm going to name it uh, name print. I'm going to add a quick description print names of people. I want to make this repository public so uh, other contributors will be able to find it online. I want to add a readme file. Remember, this is one of those files uh, that helps other people understand what this project is about. Uh, and I want to choose a license from the very beginning. Uh, for example, I want to use a MIT license. Uh, and as soon as I click, create repository, it creates a repository. And sometimes I need to refresh here, uh, but you will see this is my maintainer's remote repository. It's uh, it's named, it's, it's in the maintainer's namespace. Uh, it has one branch and the branch is called main uh, and it has one commit, it's called initial commit. Uh, I have two files, license and readme and readme is visible here as well. Um, here, I'll, uh, the, the next step I want to do is I want to add print.py uh, to this file. So I, I want to click the screen uh, download code button uh, and copy the SSH address. And I'll go to my terminal. And if you can't see my terminal, please feel free to stop me. Um, I have made this uh, demo directory under which I have two separate directories, contributor and maintainer. So when I'm acting as a maintainer, I'll be in maintainer directory. And when I'm wearing my contributor hat, I'll be in contributor directory. So um, let's look at what's inside here. There's nothing here. I'll go ahead and clone this repository right now. Uh, looks like it's here now. So let's uh, go in and look at the files inside. I have exactly two files, license and readme, um, the ones I saw online. Uh, if I run a git status, it'll tell me I'm on branch main and it's up to date with origin main and working tree clean. So everything's good here. If I do a git log, it'll show me the only commit that I have. Uh, and that's from maintainer called initial commit. 
So the next thing I want to do, I want to bring this print.py file here. Uh, I just copied it. If you do a list, we will see it right here. Um, it's contents. Let me show you its contents. It's a, it's a tiny Python script that asks for your full name and makes a guess at, you know, um, by makes a guess at your first name by separating, uh, separating it by spaces and then prints it back. So if you want to give it a try, for example, if I put my full name here, it prints my first name back. Um, and now, now the file is in directory, uh, but remember, I cannot run git push just yet. Uh, if I do a git status, it tells me there are untracked files and I need to run git add to include this file to be um, in, in upcoming comment. So if I do git add print.py and run git status again, now it says, okay, this is in stage now uh, and it's a, it's a change to be committed. And the next step is uh, creating the actual commit. So I'll do a git commit dash dash message uh, add print.py. And now git status will tell me uh, my branch is ahead of origin. Uh, and origin here refers to GitHub. Uh, the next step is running git push. And as a maintainer, I should be able to refresh this page and see two commits now. And the latest commit is called add print.py. And the print.py file is here. So uh, next thing I will do is I'll switch to being a contributor now. And uh, magically, I will come across this project that I want to contribute to. But remember, this is in someone else's namespace, so I can't contribute to it. So I'll, I'll click this uh, fork button up here. And once it's forking, uh, once it's done with forking, uh, you will see that the, the resulting repository is under my namespace now. It's not a uh, maintainer's repository anymore. Well, it's, it's forked from maintainer's repository, uh, but it's under my namespace now, so I can commit my changes to it. Uh, I will do the same thing. I'll copy the address here. Go back to terminal. Let's actually move out of maintainer directory and move into contributor directory this time. There's nothing here yet. I will clone this repository. Um, and uh, let's look at what's in there. Let's go in. If I do an ls, you will see the print.py is here. Uh, if I do a git status, it's up to date. If I do a git log, I see two commits, both from OS maintainer. Now as contributor, the change I want to do is um, updating print.py. Instead of getting first names, printing first names, I want to print full names instead. Uh, so if you look at the new print.py, it just asks for full name and prints the full name. And if we give this a try, if I print my full name here, it will print it back to me. So this is the change I want to make. Uh, if I run a git status, it's going to say, okay, there are some changes, but they're not staged for the comic game. Uh, the thing I need to do here is git add. Um, let's do git status again. It says, okay, you made some changes and those changes are in stage. So these are ready to be committed. Uh, the next step is creating a commit dash dash message, uh, print full names. And once you do that, now I have uh, a, a branch main on my local that is ahead of origin main by one commit. Um, and if I do a git log, this time you will see three commits. Uh, first two from maintainer and the third one from contributor called print full names. The natural next step is running git push. Uh, and let's go back to uh, GitHub. If I refresh, you will see now there's three commits and the last one is called print full names. Uh, and if you go into print.py, you will see it's only two lines now. Let's go back uh, and notice this uh, banner that says this branch is one commit ahead of OS maintainer's main. So this is exactly what I want to do. It brings me a pull request button. If I click that pull request button, um, it's gonna show me, I want to merge 
contributors name print uh, main branch back into maintainers name print main branch. And if I click create pull request, it's gonna give me a space to add something nice, uh, you know, say something nice, uh, maybe add reasoning to, um, and click create pull request. As soon as you create, you click that button, your pull request is ready. Um, it's open, submitted, and there. Uh, next step is switching back to maintainers hat. And you see the, uh, the previous state of the page didn't have any pull requests here. If I refresh, you'll notice a one uh, pull request. And if I go in here, I can add like a, a reaction. Um, and then I, the, the, I can see the changes here. I can look at the comments that cause those changes, uh, or I can leave a comment, um, maybe saying thank you. And uh, merging the pull request is easy as clicking this button, confirm merge. If I go back to repository, it will show me um, now we have four commits. Um, and first two are from maintainer, and third one from contributor that changes print first names into print full names, uh, and, and, and a merge commit created by uh, creates automatically. Uh, that's that's the demo, um, and I hope it was useful. Uh, before going away, I, I just uh, had um, some closing notes. Where to go from here? You know, how do you find your first open source project to contribute to? Um, the first thing people always say is you should take a look at applications you are already using because you are a uh, uh, a, a potential contributor to those applications. You already know what they do. You're already familiar with user interface, etc. cetera. Um, so take a look at those. Maybe some of those are uh, open source uh, and some of those may be looking for help. Um, so that's, that's one idea. Um, since this is a, a, a conference, I would also recommend looking going to talks uh, and maybe find people who are looking for help with their projects. Uh, also, exhibit hall is a great idea, uh, both in uh, in-person conferences and and this conference as well. Uh, even though it's an online conference, there's an exhibit hall that you can visit uh, and ask uh, people if they, uh, you know, are welcoming uh, beginners. Uh, there are some challenges like Hacktoberfest. Uh, it's a challenge that happens uh, during the month of October. Uh, it um, it wants you to um, submit um, a, a decided amount of pull requests to uh, projects that are opted in to Hacktoberfest. So you can't just go ahead and submit anything, um, but it's a, it's a fun uh, challenge and you can get uh, swag as well. You can get my free t-shirt. Uh, PullRequest.club is a, is a website I'm running uh, where I'm trying to uh, match maintainers to contributors. Um, so maintainers sign up and they uh, they just select some of their repositories uh, which are added to uh, the assignment pool uh, and contributors sign up and they get random assignments from assignment pool uh, each month. The assignment is to submit one pull request. So it's fun if you're, um, if that sounds interesting to you. Um, Sorry to interrupt, uh, just to remind you, we have five minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Um, another um, challenge I can recommend is called perlweeklychallenge.org. Um, and even though the, the Perl is in the name, uh, I think it accepts um, uh, answers from other programming languages as well. Uh, the way it works is each uh, at the beginning of each week, I think they release some questions uh, that kind of look like interview questions. Um, so you get to uh, both exercise with your interview questions skills and also with your uh, pull request kit skills because they want you to submit your answers um, through pull requests to, uh, to their GitHub repository. So that's also something I can recommend. Um, I want to close with 
two book recommendations. Uh, the first one is Forge Your Future with Open Source by VM uh, Bresser, who is uh, a speaker at this very conference. Um, this book is a great book. It will, I think it'll take you from zero to 100. It gives you pretty much like everything you need to know uh, about open source before uh, joining a project, before starting to you know, contribute to a project. Um, and the second book I want to recommend is called How Open Source Ate Software by Gordon Half. Uh, and that book will give you the, uh, the historical aspect. Uh, it will tell you how open source and you know, free software became what they are today. Um, so that's a really fun book to read. Um, with that said, I think uh, that's all I have. I'll uh, go ahead and leave my email in Zoom chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. That's it.